We are live. Just give me a minute to check, make sure that we actually are live. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good morning. Welcome to the, today's New York City uh, Council, Remote Council hearing on the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I need to start the recording. Oh, sorry. Backup is rolling. Computer's good. Thank you. Cloud is rolling as well. So again, good morning and welcome to today's New York City Council Remote Hearing on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. At this time, with all panelists, please turn on your videos. If you <clears throat> to minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent. Thank you. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Diana Ayala, and I am the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I would like to welcome you to our here at remote hearing today. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that we have been joined by council members Menchaca, Brennan, Ku, and Yeager. Today, we will be hearing testimony on introduction 2448 by council member Gibson in relation to providing paid time to employees who accompany a child to receive a COVID-19 vaccination injection or care for a child with COVID-19 vaccine side effects. The development and efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines have been miraculous in their prevention of infections, hospitalizations, and deaths from the virus. Epidemiologists at Yale University estimated that New York City's vaccination campaign has prevented about 250,000 COVID-19 cases, 44,000 hospitalizations, and over 8,000 deaths from COVID-19 infection since the start of that vaccination campaign through July 1st, 2021. For those vaccinated, life in the city has begun to return to normal. Life, uh, life theater and arts have reopened, our restaurants are operating at 100% capacity, and the vibrancy and vitality of the city has reemerged. Unlike this time last year, next week, families will gather for Thanksgiving without the fear of endangering loved ones. For those that remain unvaccinated, however, COVID-19 has continued to spread and impact their daily lives. This is especially true for children. During the early months of the pandemic, children were considered very low risk of contracting, spreading, or becoming sick with COVID-19. However, as new strains of the virus have developed and as new research has been analyzed, it is clear that children are not only carriers and spreaders of the virus, but may also fall sick due to COVID-19, even if that happens less frequently than it does for adults. Children's ability to carry and transmit the virus is concerning as well as it, is, as it is, uh, has hampered the ability for the city to return to normal. In the past week, two schools in Queens were closed due to COVID-19 outbreaks. The closure of schools due to COVID-19 outbreaks impedes students' learning and forces parents to provide childcare on a moment's notice. Thankfully, children can now access safe and effective vaccines. The FDA issued an emergency use authorization or e, uh, EUA for children between the ages of 12 and 15 this past May. On October 29, 2021, the FDA issued an EAU for the use of vaccines for children between the ages of 5 and 11. The vaccine safety was studied with over 3,000 children ages 5 to 11 who received the vaccine and no serious side effects have been detected in the ongoing study. The nearly 2 million of city residents under the age of 18 who can now get vaccinated will be a major boost to the city's recovery from the pandemic and will further protect those most vulnerable to serious illness from COVID-19. Nonetheless, parents accompanying their children to get a vaccine should not have to choose between the vaccination of their children are going uh, to work and going uh, a workday unpaid. More than a thousand sites will open this month as schools across the city for um, to offer vaccinations to children. However, there have already been reports of extremely long wait times. Outside public school 40 on East 19th Street, a child reported waiting six hours in line to get the shot. Not every parent or guardian has the luxury of taking six hours out of their day to accompany their child to get the vaccine. As the mayor has said, you shouldn't have to choose between your paycheck and the health of your family. We must ensure that every city parent and guardian has the ability to get their child vaccinated. 
The mayor has provided the ability for all city employees and contractors to receive four hours of sick pay, uh, leave per child, which allows parents and caregivers uh, to care for their children should the child experience side effects from the vaccine. This same right must be extended to private workers as well. Intro 2448, which we are hearing today, would uh, update the uh, Earned Safe and Sick Time Act to include requirements for employers to provide employees who are parents with paid COVID-19 child vaccination time. We will hear feedback from the administration and advocates today on this important bill. I will now turn it over to Council Member Gibson if she's here. Is she here? She is not here. Um, I want to recognize that we've been joined by Council Member Kalos. So I will assume that we will then go to testimony from the admin. Thank you, Chair. Um, we will be turning to testimony from the admin. Um, I am Stephanie Jones, Counsel to the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, and I'll be moderating. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. At this hearing, we will first be inviting testimony from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. For all panelists, when called on to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any. We will now call representatives of the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony from Peter Hatch, Commissioner of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. We will also be joined for questions by Ben Holt, Deputy Commissioner of the Office of Labor Policy and Standards at DCWP, and Stephen Atanani, Executive Director for External Affairs at DCWP. At this time, I will administer the affirmation. Administration panelists, please raise your right hands and I will call on each of you individually to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Hatch. I do. Thank you, Commissioner. Deputy Commissioner Holt. I do. Thank you. Executive Director Atanani. I do. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Commissioner Hatch to present his testimony. Thank you, Council. Good morning, Chair Ayala and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I'm Peter Hatch, Commissioner of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, or DCWP. Uh, as mentioned, I'm joined by Ben Holt, our Deputy Commissioner for the Office of Labor Policy and Standards, and Stephen Etnani, our Executive Director for External Affairs. It's a pleasure to testify before you for the first time, and I look forward to our work together. DCWP protects consumers and workers through enforcement of consumer protection and key workplace laws. We also promote New York City's economic recovery by supporting small businesses and encouraging a culture of compliance. As a lead for the Small Business First Initiative, DCWP continues to make great strides to streamline the licensing process with a focus on customer service and to increase transparency through expanded outreach and education to businesses to ensure equitable enforcement and to reduce the number and cost of violations. In 2020, we joined with sister agencies to promote the safe reopening of our city's businesses and more recently have been one of the primary agencies assigned to implement Key to NYC as part of our city's ongoing recovery efforts. In 2014, when Mayor de Blasio signed Council Member Chin's paid sick leave legislation into law, he declared that New York City was leading the nation in guaranteeing access to sick leave for employees, and that this law is about, quote, making our businesses run better and protecting the health and welfare of their customers, end quote. Our first media campaign about paid sick leave reminded employers that if their employees feel 100%, they'll work 100%. Those priorities for consumers, for workers, and our businesses remain ours at DCWP today. While some criticize the 2014 law is too burdensome for small business, evidence shows it's been a success for our city's workers at low or no cost to the vast majority of city businesses. 
That's why this administration has been proud to partner with the council on expansions of the law. The 2017 expansion provided crucial safely for our workers. And during the pandemic, further expansions provided more hours of leave and greater access, including to domestic workers, ensuring robust protections for the more than 3.6 million private sector employees in total eligible for paid safe and sick leave, PSSL. From the beginning, we knew that for this law to be effective and to empower workers, we would need to be committed to ongoing outreach and education about these rights. So since 2014, we've held more than 2,400 events on the requirements and protections of PSSL, reaching more than 120,000 New Yorkers. And when we launched our first public awareness campaign, we invested significant resources in language access and ethnic media, and we continue to do so to this day to reach our city's vibrant communities and diverse workforce. We also have been committed to ongoing outreach and education for employers about how to comply with PSSL, providing them with tools and training to make that easier. During the initial implementation of PSSL in 2014, we even instituted a six month penalty-free grace period to alleviate concerns about costs related to this new law. Just as we did in 2014, DCWP continues to host business roundtables and trainings. And this past year alone, we reached nearly 3,000 participants working in partnership with our city's chambers of commerce, business improvement districts, and other key business advocates. DCWP enforces paid safe and sick leave through our Office of Labor Policy and Standards. And since 2014, we've secured more than $14 million in restitution and civil penalties related to PSSL violations, which has helped more than 38,000 workers in our city. Just a few weeks ago, we announced settlements with major airlines totaling more than $235,000 in restitution for ground crew workers whose PSSL rights have been violated, including one worker who was illegally fired just for taking sick leave. Through our efforts, that worker was reinstated with their position and awarded back pay. Paid sick leave during COVID-19. So throughout this pandemic, we've seen how important sick leave is to keeping our city healthy and putting us on the road to recovery. In 2020, this administration was proud to partner with the council to expand PSSL to 56 hours for more than 1.8 million eligible private sector workers and to provide greater coverage to more than 200,000 of our city's paid care workers to make it easier for them to accrue and utilize this leave so that many more workers had the leave time they needed to keep themselves and their loved ones safe from COVID. The outset of the pandemic, DCWP prioritized educating workers on their right to use PSSL for COVID-19 testing, for quarantine, recovery, and finally to get vaccinated once the vaccines became available. DCWP developed guidance summarizing new COVID-19 related protections that were passed at the state and federal levels to provide workers with additional leave for quarantining, taking care of their children, if schools closed, and to recover from any effects of COVID. To get this information to the public, we worked through our traditional outreach partners, including community-based organizations and elected officials. And we also expanded our efforts to work with the city's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and test and trace core so that we were providing PSSL materials at COVID-19 test sites, vaccination sites, and even in a door knocking campaign in communities most impacted by the pandemic. This spring, we continued to raise awareness about PSSL and recent amendments to the law through paid media campaigns targeting healthcare settings and also neighborhoods where violations of the PSSL were reported. Second phase of that campaign launches this month and will run through the end of the year to coincide with flu season. During the pandemic, we also worked to help businesses understand how to safely navigate reopening after months of closures and to remind them that their employees could use the PSSL benefits as needed for COVID-19. This education not only stressed how important this was to employers and their workers' safety, but also to keep their customers safe. In 2020, we held more than 30 business education days all across the city, visiting thousands of businesses to help them understand best practices for being safe at work. 
as well as informing their workers about PSSL rights. DCWP also conducted 9,000 inspections for health and safety as part of a larger interagency coordinated effort to promote compliance. compliance. At the outset of the pandemic, we adopted a fast track enforcement process to get workers impacted by COVID-19 faster results. For example, securing pay for workers who took leave due to COVID-19 or affirming a worker's ability to take leave uh, to care for a child whose school closed. We knew that making sure workers had access to this leave during the pandemic meant we were not just protecting them, but also, as you mentioned, Chair, their families, their coworkers, and their employers. Now, we also know vaccination is essential to protecting New Yorkers and the city's recovery. So when the mayor appointed me commissioner of this agency, I committed that DCWP would enforce our paid sick leave law to boost vaccination rates among working New Yorkers. Regarding intro 2448, Mayor de Blasio has noted consistently that the only reason New York City is having such a strong recovery is vaccination. And for that reason, this administration had pursued policies to get as many shots in arms as possible, as fast as possible, by reducing as many barriers to access as possible. Last week, the mayor issued a personnel order granting city employees four hours of additional sick leave per child up to age 18 per COVID-19 vaccination. So parents or guardians have the leave they need to take their children to get vaccinated or to care for them should they experience side effects. Today, we're proud to partner with the council on intro 2448, which would provide those same benefits to New York City's approximately 3.6 million private sector employees. This proposed expansion of PSSL comes at a time when there are approximately 700,000 children newly eligible for COVID-19 vaccine and their parents may have little or no leave left this close to the end of the calendar year. Intro 2448 is an opportunity to reduce a significant barrier to taking your child to get vaccinated fear of losing a paycheck or worse, a job. Like past amendments to the PSSL, it gives employees increased flexibility at work and cultivates a safe, safe and productive work environment for employees and employers. I encourage this committee and the council to do what it has done many times before when presented with an opportunity to support working New Yorkers and their families by expanding this important law. Past intro, 2448 quickly and help ensure that this city's recovery is a recovery for all of us. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today and I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. Before we move on to questions, we'd like to hand, turn it over to Councilmember Gibson, prime sponsor of intro 2448 to provide an opening statement on her bill. Councilmember Gibson. Thank you so much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Chair Ayala and all of my colleagues on the Consumer Affairs Committee. I'm grateful to join all of you. Apologies for the delay. I was at a school this morning, um, but I really wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you to our Chair, Diana Ayala, for holding this very important hearing on this very important topic. I am proud to work with Mayor Bill de Blasio at his request to introduce intro 2448, of 2021, uh, which would relate to amending our city's uh, paid sick leave. Uh, as we continue as a city to fight against COVID-19, keep New Yorkers safe in our city, it's really important that we continue to encourage all New Yorkers to get vaccinated and, sure, and ensure that every New Yorker is safe and getting the access to the vaccine. During the onset of this pandemic as a legislative body, the City Council, we've acknowledged so many of our first responders and essential workers and frontline staff who were out in the trenches providing services, continuity of care in a culturally responsive and sensitive way to make sure that many New Yorkers were getting access to not just COVID-19 testing, but also the vaccine. Intro 2448, which is on today's agenda, would expand the City's Earn Safe and Sick Time Act by including paid leave for any employee who is a parent or legal guardian accompanying a child to receive a COVID-19 vaccination or care for a child with COVID-19 vaccine 
side effects. Not only is this important to keep our children and their families safe from COVID-19, but it will also ensure that no one has to choose between a paycheck and what is best for their ch children and their children's health. Uh, unlike adults, children are not able to navigate the vaccine appointments alone. So they need their caregivers, they need their parents, and they need their guardians. And so this option to take time off from work in order to care for their children will really address a lot of the issues that we've been facing. Uh, we must expand New York City's Earn Safe and Sick Time Act to support all of our parents and all of our children in their overall efforts to become vaccinated without fear of losing their income. I again want to say thank you to our commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Hatch, for your leadership. Uh, welcome to our hearing, and I'm really looking forward to working with you as someone who has been fully vaccinated, who is about to get the booster shot, uh, who has small children in my own family. I want to make sure that we're doing our part. And this bill, intro 2448, is a step forward in providing the access and opportunity that New Yorkers will need to get their children vaccinated. So let's continue to work together to keep New Yorkers safe, to provide access and opportunity for all New Yorkers by passing intro 2448. Thank you so much again, Commissioner, to you and your team. And certainly thank you to my wonderful and amazing chair, my Bronx colleague and sister, Chair Diana Ayala. Thank you so much to the staff. Thank you, council member. Uh, we will now turn it over to questions from Chair Ayala. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Chair Ayala. Yeah, so before I begin, council member Goodson, did you have any questions? Yeah, uh, actually just one. Okay. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you for indulging me. Commissioner, could you just provide my colleagues and I with an understanding um, with this particular intro 2448 on today's agenda, uh, what measures uh, will the department take to actually make sure that parents are informed of this new law? Um, what, what sort of assistance would you like from the city council to make sure that we can work with our uh, providers and parents and other organizations and different leaders in our community so we can make sure that people are very much aware of what this new law will provide for themselves and their families. Councilmember Gibson, good morning. Thank you for that, you. Uh, for your opening statement, um, your leadership in being the prime sponsor of this bill and that question. Um, you, you know, speaking as both a New Yorker and a parent of now vaccine eligible children, um, I agree with you. It's incredibly important that we make uh, eligible workers aware when this bill passes, that they have this incremental increase in leave time. Um, otherwise, all of our efforts, right, will, will, will not come to uh, what we want them to. So we feel like we've begun to communicate to parents already through uh, the mayor's press conference uh, last week, talking about uh, the personnel order and this proposed legislation to extend that to all private sector workers in New York City um, through today's hearing. Uh, with you and the committee um, and through uh, sort of uh, an acceleration of DCWP's ongoing commitment to educate workers about paid safe and sick leave law. Um, specifically uh, for this uh, extension of the law, we would want to continue uh, partnering with community-based organizations that are trusted messengers in key communities, uh, elected officials' offices such as yours. Um, we would implement um, the use of um, all of our materials being translated into more than a dozen languages, um, the use of our staff who themselves speak uh, so many key languages uh, in New York. Um, and we would also continue our expanded partnerships um, with our healthcare partners in the city, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Test and Trace Corps at New York City Health and Hospitals, so that we are reaching parents and families where they're looking for information uh, about vaccine. Um, we agree okay. with you, this is incredibly important. Okay, just another question. Uh, what could we say to New Yorkers who have children between the ages of five and 11 that have underlying health conditions? So the Bronx has some of the lowest vaccination rates. Chair Ayala and I are working extremely hard with many of our CBOs and our healthcare providers on the ground. Uh, because I think, you know, there's been a resistance, there's been a little bit of hesitancy and anxiety 
for many parents of small children that may have underlying health conditions. So what message are we giving to those New Yorkers who have those children that may, you know, live with asthma or may have childhood diabetes? What are we saying to them in terms of the vaccine uh, that we want them to get their children vaccinated because this can help with a lot of the diseases that they may be living with today? What are some of the messages around uh, these specific New Yorkers? Council member, we're, I'll leave the, the healthcare advice uh, you know, to my okay. colleagues at the Department of Health and, and Health and Hospitals. Um, the Got message it. that we're going to focus on from our agency is potential other sources of hesitation that parents may feel, that concern that taking that bit of time off to protect their children through vaccination or to care for a child who may not be feel, feel well afterwards, um, that they have to worry about lost wages or worse, possible termination at work. We wanna remove that barrier, that form of hesitation among many things that may be on parents' minds at this mind. So they will move rapidly to get their kids vaccinated, which is the most important way we feel as a city to protect children, to protect families, including older members of our households, plus our mm -hmm. communities. Okay. And we'll make sure that, that the materials we disseminate have the best public health messaging the city has to offer. Okay, definitely. Well, I look forward to working with you and your team, as well as DOHMH and Health and Hospitals uh, to disseminate as much information uh, in an accurate way, in a real creative way, meeting residents on the ground. Um, I also talk about faith and clergy leaders Many of our houses of worship, you know, they can encourage their parishioners to also get their children vaccinated. I mean, I think, you know, we have to always be creative in getting the message across because there will always be those New Yorkers that are hesitant. But I do think a majority of uh, our New Yorkers are excited and will take advantage of this. So I look forward to working with you and your team. And thank you again, Chair Ayala, for allowing me to ask questions before you, Madam Chair. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Those were really good questions, Vanessa. Thank you. Um, so I'm assuming, but just just to piggyback off of Councilmember Gibson's question, um, there, there, is there a partnership with the the the, the New York City uh, Department of Education? I mean, we have uh, parent coordinators that are really reliable uh, sources of information for parents. Is that is that partnership? Does it, is it existing or is that part of the plan? Uh, Madam Chair, that is a great question. Uh, just in the, in, the, in the last few weeks, DCWP has partnered with the Department of Education to disseminate uh, through the channels that you just described information around the child tax credit, for example. Um, so we absolutely intend to, uh, to implement uh, the, using all of the department's channels direct to parents and through parent coordinators and the many uh, staff they have that work uh, with families that we want to be aware of uh, this important new uh, leave that we hope will become available when we pass this law quickly. I appreciate that. Now, it should the, should this bill become law, which I have no no uh, reason to believe that it wouldn't, um, are there any type of employees in the city that would not receive paid child COVID vaccination leave? Thank you for that question. In, in, in the interest of um, meeting this uh, time sensitive challenge quickly, that is new cohort of children available to be vaccinated and the possibly that many workers may be short on leave. Um, we, we, to work expeditiously, we, we set this expansion within the context of the existing uh, PSSL law. Uh, that law covers uh, private sector employees as defined, uh, defined by state law. Um, so there may be independent contractors who wouldn't be covered by this uh, expansion. Okay. Okay. However, you know, we are always interested in working with the council to look yes. for ways uh, to offer protections to even greater numbers of working people in, in New York. I appreciate that. Now, in, in terms of the, the four hour uh, timeline, how, how did we arrive at four hours? Like, uh, I mean, we're hearing reports of uh, children waiting up to six hours to get vaccinated. Um, you know, is there some flexibility there? I, I'm, I'm not sure how we're, how we arrived at the four hour timeline. Um, so the initial framework uh, for this proposed legislation um, uh, builds off of the mayor's personnel order announced just, uh, just over a week ago. 
uh, which provided a, an additional increment uh, of four hours of leave for city employees for the mm -hmm. same purpose um, to you know, support vaccination and care uh, for children uh, five to, uh, to um, 17. Um, and uh, we felt that, that the increment of four hours was a reasonable one uh, to lower parents' potential hesitation. Oh, I don't have enough leave to take this step to keep my children and families safe. Um, and that it was also, um, you know, would have a de minimis impact uh, on, on employers. Okay. I mean, but I'm assuming, well, I, I, I'm just wondering, is there, you know, is somebody monitoring, right? Um, this, the situation at the schools, is, because if we are, if we have children waiting, um, you know, six hours um, and, the, you know, we're not really, I don't think that we're meeting our mandate, right? And so I'm just looking to see this flexibility, right? In terms of, you know, coming, maybe coming back and amending this if it's possible or working with, you know, the Department of Health to expedite the time, you know, the, the wait time um, for vaccination at the schools. What, what type of coordination is happening behind the scenes? Let me, um, thank you for that question. Let me note first um, that the existing uh, PSSL um, does provide leave, right? That would cover taking a child to get vaccinated. Um, so uh, this is an increment beyond that. So in an occasion which an individual family needs that a little bit of time, they can rely on their existing, uh, you know, paid sick leave. Um, and of course, I should state that, you know, this administration is completely committed to accelerating vaccination for every New Yorker, including newly eligible children. Um, and I believe the mayor has uh, spoken this week about the need to streamline vaccine access at schools. Um, and of course, we have uh, provided lots of vaccine access through other points of care, through the Department of Health, um, you know, and also uh, health and hospitals. Um, if I may, um, Deputy Commissioner Holt, do you want to note anything additional uh, uh, about, um, you know, leave families might access it if, if needed, if that four hour increment, um, you know, didn't entirely work for them? Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair Ayala and committee for having me today. Um, uh, Commissioner, I believe you covered the primary leave options very well. The only additional uh, leave type I would note um, is there is uh, a type of leave under the city's temporary schedule change law, which could afford a worker up to two days of unpaid leave time uh, that can be used for the same purposes as paid safe and sick leave. Uh, including child vaccination time, as we're talking about today. I, I also just want to note, um, Chair, that it sounds like you're hearing reports from your constituents or your colleagues' constituents about, um, you know, pods or different vaccine vaccine centers that may have extended wait times. I want to connect with you offline to find out exactly where those centers are, so that I can speak with my colleagues in the health department and at the vaccine command center to to uh, make sure that they're aware of the, of that. I know as the temperatures are dropping here, we certainly don't want children out waiting for several hours for this important. Um, um, vaccine. So let's connect offline. I do want to find out a little bit more information about extended wait times there. Thank you, Steve. And I think that that's particularly, you know, true for parents with children with disabilities, um, you know, oftentimes, right, you know, they, they're uh, children with autism. Um, they require, you know, a parent to be there, right? Um, they, they, they don't trust, right? They're walking into someone that they don't know. And, you know, they're not they're not walking into their their their, their private, uh, you know, doctor's office, and that creates a level of anxiety uh, mm -hmm. that is often, you know, uh, best handled by a parent being, you know, uh, being there with them. So my concern is really just like, you know, I, I appreciate um, the legislation, but I always think about the unintended consequences. Where right? are we really wrapping around, um, you know, services and ensuring that yeah, we're putting in this this policy, but that we're also recognizing that there are some challenges that may even, you know, make this difficult to, to, to kind of manage. So um, I appreciate that. And I think that, you know, some of the reports that we're hearing back are primarily from uh, school-based uh, clinics where, uh, you know, we were experiencing some time, some delays in, in, in the timeline, right, for getting children vaccinated. So the wait times are inconsistent. Some schools have no wait time and other schools are just backlogged for some reason. So any, any assistance with that and trying to figure that out 
um, is greatly appreciated uh, because not only are parents missing you know time from work, but children are also missing time from school. So um, so that's important. Um, I have no further questions. I want to thank you. I don't know if Council Member Yeager or Council Member Fu have any questions, or Council Member Menchaca, who's also here. No. Then I'll turn it over to Committee Council. Thank you, Chair. We will now turn to public testimony, seeing as there are no hands raised for questions. Um, after public testimony, council members who have questions for this panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. I would like to now welcome Cassandra Gomez to testify. Ms. Gomez? Thank you to the chair and to the committee for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Cassandra Gomez, and I am a staff attorney at A Better Balance. A Better Balance is a national legal advocacy organization dedicated to promoting fairness in the workplace and helping employees meet the conflicting demands of work and family. Here in New York City, we helped draft the Earned Sick Time Act and negotiated the final terms of the legislation. We are thrilled that this important piece of legislation is being considered, and we urge the committee to move forward with and pass intro 2448. From early on in the vaccine distribution effort in the US, workers have been clear that access to paid time off to get vaccinated and recover from any side effects would make them more likely to get vaccinated. This summer, workers whose employers provided paid time off to get the vaccine or recover from any, any side effects were 24% more likely to have received at least one dose of the vaccine than workers whose employers provided no paid vaccine leave. And, and workers with lower household incomes are less likely to receive paid leave for the COVID-19 vaccine, which has resulted in much lower vaccination rates for low-income adults as compared to higher-income adults. Now that children ages five and up are eligible to receive the vaccine, working families in New York City will need immediate access to paid leave to help family members receive and recover from the vaccine. Our city must ensure that responsible workers do not have to lose pay in order to shield their children from the virus. Intro 2448 will undoubtedly serve the city well and increase the likelihood that New York families will get vaccinated. The legislation proposed today would add to the existing sick time law, the right to take COVID-19 child vaccination time for workers to accompany children to receive the COVID-19 vaccine and recover from related side effects. Among other strengths, this COVID-19 child vaccination time is in addition to earn safe and sick time under existing law and must be paid. As detailed in our written testimony, to make this bill even stronger, we recommend amending it to give workers access to more paid time off to care for children recovering from the COVID-19 vaccine and expanding the bill to allow workers to take time off to assist all family members as defined in the Earn Safe and Sick Time Act in receiving their vaccine injections and to care for family members recovering from the vaccine. As a city that was once the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic in the US, we must do all that we can to ensure that we never again let COVID-19 cases rise to the levels of the worst peaks of the pandemic. Passing intro 2448 will be crucial to protecting the children of New York and stopping the spread of COVID-19. We enthusiastically urge the council to ensure intro 2448's passage. Thank you, Cassandra. I was gonna ask you two questions, but you kind of answered them <laughs> through your testimony. So thank you so much for that. Uh, turn it back to committee council just to see if any of the council members have questions. Thank you. At this time, I, I don't see any council members hands raised on Zoom. Uh, if you do have questions, please raise them now. Okay, seeing no hands raised, I'll turn it back over to you, Chair, to give a closing statement. Thank you. Well, I just wanna thank Councilmember Gibson. Um, Commissioner Hatch, welcome. Uh, this is our first hearing. Thank you so much, it's a pleasure uh, working with you and your team. Um, uh, Deputy Commissioner Hall, uh, Steve uh, Tanani, and, and obviously Cassandra, thank you so much for all of your work. And to uh, the committee staff, thank you uh, so much for putting um, every effort into ensuring that um, families are protected during this time and that, you know, we're considering, you know, all of the factors, right, that impact, um, you know, workers 
uh, during this pandemic. So thank you so much. And I look forward to the next hearings.